This episode of the Practice of Therapy podcast is brought to you by Therapy Notes, therapynotes.com. Therapy Notes has everything you need to manage patient records, schedule appointments, create rich documentation, and bill insurance right at your fingertips. Their streamlined software is accessible wherever and whenever you need it. It's what I use in my practice. And now they have a patient portal that provides telehealth. It's a HIPAA secure telehealth portal all in one place that's easy for you and easy for your clients to access. So be sure and check them out today, therapynotes.com. And if you'll use the coupon code GORDON, just G-O-R-D-O-N, you can get two months of their services for free. This is the Practice of Therapy podcast with Gordon Brewer, helping you to navigate your private practice journey. This is session number 139 of the Practice of Therapy podcast. Hello, folks. I'm Gordon Brewer. Glad you've joined me for the Practice of Therapy podcast. Um, Hope you're doing well. Hope you're uh, making it through these uh, tough times that we're in with the whole COVID pandemic thing still going on as we're recording this. I know that things here where I am have changed a good bit over the last several weeks and that we've seen a real real big spike in the number of cases. And so it's caused me, at least in our practice, to pull back. And uh, we had transitioned back to the office for those folks that really preferred to come in to see us, but now we're having to transition back out of that. And so that's, uh, you know, you you kind of go with the flow when those things happen. Uh, but I think the other thing that has happened for a lot of folks, I know for me, Uh, in particular, is just really having to look at our priorities and really kind of really, really rethink a lot of things. And I know that 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 is a lot of the anxiety that we feel as well is because we're having to go through these immense changes and huge things uh, with our practices, just reevaluating what is happening in our practices and that sort of thing. So anyway, I'm I'm looking forward to you hearing from my guest for for this week. I've got Rachel Barbanel Freed, uh, another one of those people that uh, reached out to me about being on the podcast, and she is I think got just a really wonderful message just about pivoting your practice, and um, so I'm I'm looking for you forward to you hearing that conversation that I had uh, with Rachel. Um, One thing I want to mention to you is that um, um, uh, in terms of pivoting things. I'm really uh, working on a lot of kind of projects, mostly in my head. And I know one of the things that I've really got to do is put these into action, but really working on some some things that are going to be new with the G Suite for Therapists course of really, uh, really creating an add on to that and uh, really around systems and processes. But one of the things I've shared in previous episodes is that I started a Facebook group called uh, G Suite for Therapist Facebook group, and it's a private Facebook group. And we've now got well over 3,000 members in that group where people are just having conversations about uh, using the the tools of Google G Suite in your practice as a practice management tool and that sort of thing. So I'd invite you to go over and take a look at joining that group and join some of the conversations in there. We've got a lot of great Uh, A lot of great people that are participating in that. And also, just uh, if you want to just learn more about Google G Suite and just how you can use those different tools in your practice, I do have the G Suite for Therapists course that's available. And as I said, I'm I'm doing some add-ons to that, really more specifically around... um, uh, systems and processes and how you can how you can put all those things together to develop just a whole kind of platform if you will for yourself for managing your practice and just all the the different things that take place in running a practice so anyway I, t- I invite you to go take a look at the course G suite for therapist and it's you can find that at practice of therapy.com slash G suite course and uh, take a look at that I'll be uh, making 
making some updates. And if you uh, enroll in the course, you'll get the updates. And then you'll also be made aware of the the add-on that I'm going to be doing um, around systems and processes. And that's going to be, that'll be a whole separate course, but it's going to be more, um, more in-depth and even more specifics around creating things. So anyway, I just want to make you aware of that, that particular resource. Um, let's see, there was something else I was going to mention, but it slips me for now. Uh, well, oh, I know what it was, is be sure and subscribe to the podcast, wherever you might be listening to it. Um, I know uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I've got um, um, just a whole list of great ones that I listen to. So um, be sure and subscribe to this one, wherever you might be listening to it, whether it be on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or Stitcher or Spotify and now on Amazon Music. We're over there now and several other, most of your major podcatchers you can find us. So subscribe and leave us a review. So anyway, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you and uh, have you listen in on my conversation with Rachel Barbanel Freed. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Practice of Therapy podcast. And I'm I'm so thrilled to have gotten to meet uh, Rachel Barbanel Freed and having her on the podcast. We were just chatting here before we started recording, and I think uh, what she has on her mind, and I think on for a lot of us, is just thinking about how we're doing some pivoting and rebuilding. And so, Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Yeah, Glad it's to be here. great. To, I'm looking forward to our conversation. So um, as I start out with most everyone, why don't you tell folks a little bit more about yourself and just kind of your private practice journey and how you've landed where you've landed? Um, I am a clinical psychologist by training. I did my training in Washington, D.C., which is where I built my practice the first time. Um, and I did my training actually originally not to be in private practice. I trained to work with kids. I thought I wanted to run a school for disadvantaged, um, youth. I came to this line of study because I really liked working with all the kids who nobody else liked working with. I was really intrigued by those folks. And so that's why I did psychology. Um, and then as part of my training, I, I discovered, oh, I actually like doing therapy. And then um, it turns out that uh, it's a pretty good life in that I have gotten to build my life to look the way that I want it to. Um, and so that's kind of, I think, where you and I got excited about talking because I really think this is an amazing career choice for people who want to be able to build a life right. that looks the way they want it to look. Yes. Yes. And I think that's, yeah, that's you're, you're as I say in the South, you're talking my talk. So that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. That's mm -hmm. great. So you, you have gone through the process though of um, starting and stopping with your practice and not only, you know, just as a mom and, all of that that encompasses, but also just changing locations and moving around. So I know you've got a lot of thoughts about, you know, what it looks like to rebuild. And I think with the, um, you know, the current environment we're in, you know, as we're recording this and in the middle of a pandemic, um, a lot of us are having to do that. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. So what are, what have you kind of learned about that so far? I know that's a huge question there. It is a huge question. So I'll take a stab and see if yeah. I can answer it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first time I built my practice was in DC. And um, I was, like I said, not actually interested in building a practice at that point. I sort of, um, a friend of mine had said, oh, if you want to um, sublet for me a couple of hours, that would be great. You know, you can just sort of take what I'm not using. And I had a full time job. I was, um, running a counseling center at a small college um, and sort of built slowly one by one, you know, I had first one patient, then I had a couple, then I had 
you know, all of my mornings filled. And then I realized I wanted to kind of leave my job and start a practice. Um, so then I built a full-time practice in DC. Um, and, uh, my husband at that point, um, he's a physician and we knew he was finishing his training and we knew we were going to end up somewhere. Right. Didn't know where we were. And it happened, happened to be at that time. I, I also got pregnant. And so I closed my practice. Mm hmm sort of not knowing where we were going to land. And we landed in Boston. Mm -hmm. So came to Boston, um, you know, luckily had a, you know, he had a job, so we had that, but I knew that I wanted to build my practice again and um, spent some time talking and thinking and trying to figure out where did I really want to build my practice? What did I want my life to look like at that point? Right. What did I want my practice to look like? I had the benefit of already having had a full-time practice. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I wanted it to look like. And I very intentionally picked a place that wasn't near where I lived and picked a place that was going to be very convenient for people to get to. Mm -hmm. And really spent time building the practice to look like I wanted it to look like. Right. Right. Um, I'll share with you that I also spent a lot of time interview, you know, sort of informationally interviewing with people because I moved to Boston. Boston is a very um, institutionally driven place. Yes. Uh -huh. So everybody wanted to know, well, who are you affiliated with? Where'd you go to grad school? Who, who'd you train with? And I didn't train with anybody here. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I can't tell you how many people I interviewed with that said they're not, you're not going to be able to do what you want to do. There's no way you're going to be able to build a practice on your own without having an affiliation. And mm -hmm. I'm just not kind of the kind of person that like that just, <laughs> you know, spurred me for, further forward. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. don't tell me I can't do something because I'm going to do it twice as fast. Right. Um, and so then, you know, I built my practice and then I got pregnant again, which I had to close mm -hmm. my practice again and uh -huh. then build it another time. And I've, that's happened to me now three times. So I've been, wow. I have three kids and each time have had the, in some way, I guess it's a real luxury to be able to be very intentional about how I want to build my job and my career to fit my personal and family goals as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's, yeah, you know, um, again, uh, one, one of the things that I totally agree with you on is I think for anybody going into private practice, I think the, the one thing we have to really kind of look at is our lifestyle because that's, that's the major motivation for most of us to go into private practices that we want the autonomy that it brings and the flexibility. As I shared with you before we got started, my wife is, as we're recording, this is in the hospital. And if I hadn't been in private practice, there's no way I could have navigated this if I was working for someone else. Mm -hmm. And so I was just able to, you know, have that flexibility. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, um, that that's huge. You know, one thing you said that I'm curious about um, is that you had heard from other, I guess, other practitioners in the area there in the Boston area that were really uh, kind of stuck on, oh, you've got to be affiliated and have a name and, you know, be, you know, have a rubber stamp from this institution or that institution. My, do you think that really matters to clients? Or does that just matter to us in the profession? Um, I think that there are certain people who want you to have a pedigree, mm -hmm. right? I, I live and work in, you know, I mean, Harvard has a name, right? Mm -hmm. But Harvard also has a stereotype. So if you are somebody who wants the Harvard stereotype, and I actually 
am now, I was credentialed to be a supervisor through Harvard Med School. So now I have the pedigree, oh, but if you're the person who's looking for the pedigree, I'm probably not your person anyway. Uh-huh. Right. So, you know, I do think that, but I, but I think that people really act from a place of fear. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I do think that that's what those other clinicians were saying to me. Mm-hmm. Right. That like they didn't think they could do it. So they didn't think I could do it. Right. 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 Yeah. I think that's, um, yeah. One of the things that I think is so important to be mindful of is just, I think uh, a lot of times, particularly not that, you know, I'm, I'm all for education and a- academics and that sort of thing. But I think a lot of times, For those of us going into private practice, what we get taught in graduate school and in our training isn't really necessarily true in the real world. I think, um, you know, yeah. I mean, who gets, I don't know, my graduate school training didn't include anything about running, running, anything about running a business. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's, again, one of the things that I love doing is actually talking with people who, you know, um, mentoring people and supervising folks to build their practice, Mm -hmm. right? It's so fulfilling if you realize that actually when you have a private practice, you are a small business owner, you're an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is creating something other than just helping, which is important and great, but you're really creating something of your own vision. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So as you, as you have uh, gone through this process several times of kind of ramping down and then ramping back up with your practice, um, what would you say has been maybe some do's and don'ts and what have you found that has really worked well for you? Um, and, and just for other people that you've worked with, and, and going through this whole process. Cause I know you're, you're also helping other clinicians through, through these very, very things. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm helping other clinicians and I think actually my interest in the business side has also, um, dri- like part of what I'm doing now is also working with, um, executives. I have a lot of executives in my practice now, I think in part because I have this interest in work-life life balance, mm-hmm. in figuring mm-hmm. out the piece of business that impacts on our happiness on our, right. in, our, in our life, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so I think you have to get, most of us don't come to counseling, therapy, psychology, psychiatry because we want to run a business mm-hmm. right so you have to get comfortable talking about money and thinking about money right, right. and that is so uncomfortable for so many of us right uh-huh. you're not supposed to talk about what money sex and politics uh-huh. right? right so you got to get comfortable about talking about all this stuff you got to get comfortable with talking about all the things that are uncomfortable and so many of us are trained in our in our in our, you know, clinical training to talk about what our clients are uncomfortable with, but you also Mm -hmm. have to figure out what are you uncomfortable with. And for many of us, particularly beginning clinicians, it's really uncomfortable to say, this is my fee, right? Mm -hmm. I'm worth this amount of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I learned the hard way after getting stiffed about, you know, somewhere around $7,000 um, by a client who I just really wasn't comfortable talking about money with. And then he disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And now I'm really good about talking about money Uh and I'm really good about like talking about, well, what's, what's up with the fee? Why are you, you know, and I actually collect fees at time of service, Mm -hmm. the sort of more typical, um, psychotherapy practice where people bill at the end of the month. Uh huh. Right. You pay your hairdresser at the time. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah, and um, I think it's uh, yeah, and and you're you're right. I think a big part of the discomfort around money is our own discomfort, because I think that that most clients expect to pay us, and um, 
you know, if they're, um, and, and I think most clients know that. I mean, mm-hmm. you, well, really any, any business you go into where you're, unless it's banking or something like that, you, you pay at the time that you receive the service. So I think right. that's, uh, you know, I think our money mindset gets in the way of helping us really make our business thrive um, mm-hmm. just because we, we hold off on those things. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, I think you have to be comfortable with knowing what you do well and knowing what you're not comfortable with. Right. So knowing like what's your lane and knowing when to refer out. Right. Mm-hmm. So I start every initial intake. I say to people, you know, if I'm not the right person for whatever reason, schedule, personality, you know, subject matter, whatever it is, mm-hmm. that is no skin off my back. Right. Right. I am, my job is to help make sure you get the help you need. So Mm -hmm. if I'm not the right person, happy to help you get connected to somebody else. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, and, and I think because we, when a person does that and just really, and what you're talking about is just really defining your niche and or niche, however you prefer to say that, um, it just makes you a better clinician. If you're working with clients that are good fit for you and, and you're a good, um, you know, they're a good, they're a good fit for you and you're a good fit for them it just makes for much better clinical work as well. Um, right. Because all of us have had those clients where we look at our schedule and say, Oh no, not them today. <laughs> you right. know, that, totally. that kind and, of, and, and if we're working, right. If you're working and you're, you have your own practice and you spend your whole day, right. We, everybody comes to us because their lives are not working the way they want to. Right. Nobody right. comes because everything's going smashing. Right. right? So at the very least, I want to feel like I'm enjoying what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. right? And so that doesn't mean that like every single day I'm like psyched to go to work exactly, but, you know, it means that I feel like I'm doing what I'm good at, which helps me feel like I'm giving people what they need. And it's like a, you know, it's like a happy sort of cycle. Right. Um, something I was thinking about before that I just wanted to touch on was like, when I was building my practice, I was very intentional and, you know, I sublet first. Right. And I thought about how many patients or clients do I need to see in order to cover my expenses. Mm -hmm. And then that I kept very intentionally that number And so I tried to build to that number. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, now I want to, um, now I want to cover my expenses in my first two weeks. Right. Then I want to cover my expenses in the first week. Right. Right. So it's a very, you have to have high, hard goals. If you think about it that way, Mm -hmm. right. it, It is much more, um, achievable, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. If I know that I need two more hours per week or two more hours per day, then I can, I'm much more likely to be able to achieve that than if it's just this sort of amorphous. Number. Yes. Yes. And, and I, I, I totally agree. And it, it's one of the things that um, one process I like to help people go through, and it sounds like you do something very similar is that I think you going back to what we talked about earlier, you start with your lifestyle and, you know, there's, um, for most of us, if we break it down or really think about it, there's a, there's a, there's a number that's associated with that. You know, what is your, you know, what do you need to bring home for you and your family every year, you know, starting that, that kind of that big thing. What's, what's your salary? What do you want to pay yourself for the year? And then you work backwards from that to figure out, okay, what does that look like on a daily basis? You know, do I need to see two clients a day? Do I need to see five clients in a day? You know, whatever that is. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's a good, that's a great approach because I think um, one, one of the things, (laughs) again, this, 
for for me, it seems like common sense, but I think for a lot of people, it doesn't doesn't necessarily. Um, it may be not. They might not think about it that way. But if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? One hundred percent. Yeah, you've got to have a map. If I'm going to go on a trip, I've got to know how. If I'm going to drive to Boston to see Rachel. I've got to know where to start. I've got to know which which road to drive down first to get there. So mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that, and this is something you and I were talking about before, also, right? That this current situation that we're in is another opportunity to take stock. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. I've been talking about that with all of the people that I work with, but I've also been really trying to make sure that I am on top of that, of my, in my own life. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, What works for you and what doesn't. So we are in two separate parts of the country, right? We have very Mm -hmm. separate, like different, you know, kinds of experiences in terms of what's happening Mm -hmm. um, or what has happened. Um, you know, we shut down pretty fully here in Massachusetts, like from the beginning Mm -hmm. and now things are kind of reopening. Um, but for a number of different reasons, I have been very clear with folks that I do not actually anticipate seeing people in my office Mm -hmm. for at least a year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, for, you know, I just don't think that given what we know, there's so many things we don't know, but given what we do know about the transmission of the virus, I think the anxiety that would come from each of us having to kind of mitigate risk Mm -hmm. doesn't seem that it's worth it, especially because I've had such good results from, you know, using telemedicine. Right. Right. So I have done a combination of seeing people on Zoom and doing phone sessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's really worked for me very well about the phone sessions actually is that I take, I tell people very clearly, I'm going to walk while we're talking. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's been amazing because, you know, if you see eight people in a day, you're sitting on your keister for eight hours. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's right? correct. I love and, that idea. Yeah. And so, you know, um, the fact that I'm walking has really invigorated me. Yes. Um, and in fact, there have been a couple of ex- two examples in particular of people that I was talking with who, after being kind of sheltered in place for a long time, were actually quite anxious about getting out back out into the world. And so I said to them, Okay, we're going to do an in vivo experiment. The next time we talk, we're going to, you're going to walk, right? So mm-hmm. they're walking where they're walking. I'm walking where I'm walking. We're mm-hmm. not, we're still on the phone. So we're not near each other at all. We're not, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, like, like different towns, right? Right, right. But it enabled them to get out and get back into the world. And it's been a really, really useful um, thing for me to really, it's like, I, I kind of don't want to give this up. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, you know, what my experience has been that um, my priorities about life and what I want in my practice have totally changed since the beginning of March. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, just as a result of the of the pandemic and, you know, just other things with my wife's health and all of that sort of thing. It's just kind of like, you know, I had to sit down and just say, OK, what are my priorities now? Yeah. You know, what is what do I want my life to look like over this next year? Yep. You know, and, and just really kind of change. And it's, and it's drastic, you know it has just changed. I mean, my whole daily routine has changed and I'm sure yours is too as well. Um, you know, one of the, one of the advantages is being able to work from home more so I don't have to commute. (laughs) And so it's, uh, you know, that's been a little bit of a perk there, but, um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I really love, uh, I really love this idea though of just doing an inventory of, of your life and where you want to be in your lifestyle. And like, like you said, of really 
you're, you're correct. You've got to have that hard conversation about money and about your numbers and be brutally honest with yourself about that. Mm -hmm. I think is, is so important. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, well, Rachel, I want to be mindful of your time and um, I'm so, so glad we, we've had this conversation. I'm sure we could, we could talk for several hours about all this stuff and, and uh, that sort of thing, but tell folks how they can get in touch with you and about your website and your blog and, and all of that. Um, so I have a website. It's Dr. RBF, D-R-R-B-F dot com. Um, I have a blog um, that, you know, talking about sort of what we want our life to look like. That has been one thing that has sort of fallen off um, mm-hmm. that I have not been able to write as much uh-huh. um, since the beginning of March, in part because other things have come in. Um, I've been doing a lot more podcasts and more, um, you know, sort of teaching online. So I am hoping to um, publish more blogs, but I would love Mm -hmm. if people want to check out my blog. I'm on Instagram and Facebook, again, Um, Mm DRRBF. And I would love to, you know, connect with folks if they have any thoughts or questions about what we've talked about today. Yeah. Well, good, good. And we'll have all the links to all of those things in the in the show summary and show notes for people as they listen to the podcast. Well, well, Rachel, it's been so great to get to know you and I'm so glad uh, and hopefully we can get you back on again to, to talk about these things. Cause I think they're just uh, so pertinent and so important. And as you said, especially during the, during this time that we're in and just with the COVID pandemic and, and all of that, it just that thinking about how do you, how do you regroup and restart and all that sort of thing? So thanks. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed hearing from Rachel and I hope we've kind of given you some things to think about. Um, Uh, As I said at the very beginning, then and then as you heard in our conversation, just the importance of uh, really kind of doing a a personal inventory and just really thinking about what are our priorities. And I think that's something in private practice that's constantly changing. I know as my practice has evolved and I've gone through changes with it and just with uh, life in general, just even with the practice of therapy and the podcast and all of that, really sitting down and, and taking a hard look at what are my priorities and my, as I like to put it, my changing whys, because I think that's where we all have to start when we think about going into practice or really start with anything that we do um, that are major decisions in our life or just to to think about why and why we want to do things in in different ways. And so, um, yeah, and so I hope you enjoyed hearing from Rachel again and just thinking about what what sort of things to think about with pivoting your practice or making changes in your practice when when life's priorities changes, um, when life's priorities change, rather. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so glad you joined us for this episode. Uh, do take a look at our sponsor for the podcast, Therapy Notes, therapynotes.com. And uh, if you'll use the coupon code Gordon, just G-O-R-D-O-N, uh, you can get two months of their services for free. They're who I use in my practice, couldn't do without them. Um, also be sure and check out the G suite for therapist course that's out there, uh, to learn more about some other tools you might not be aware of, or you might be aware of and just want to learn how to use them better. So that's what that course is there for. It's practice of therapy.com slash G suite course. And, um, yeah, so it's going to be, uh, I promise it's going to be updated and uh, where well, I'm working on that. And just with, like I said earlier, that was, that was on the front of the stuff so to speak, back in uh, February. And then when things changed in March, my priorities changed because we had to focus on other things. So, and 
Um, so it's coming. Uh, just uh, we had to kind of push it down the line a little bit. So um, uh, the other the other thing is, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you might be listening to it. And let me hear from you. I love getting emails from people and just hearing uh, from people about their practices. And I know here lately I've been doing some more um, kind of brainstorming sessions and consulting sessions which are available to people. I have a free 20-minute uh, brainstorming session that is available for people to just um, talk about what their priorities are and looking at maybe how I can help them down the road if by either um, uh, doing some individual consulting with me or uh, by um, joining a mastermind group or a focus group uh, that um, – that I lead from time to time. As a matter of fact, if you're on my email list, I know that I'm going to be, uh, you're going to be getting an email from me about a friend of mine uh, who I've been in a mastermind group or been involved with previously. Um, and his name is, his name is Ryan Hallfritcher. I uh, think I'm saying your correct name, uh, your name correctly, Ryan, but I'll, I'll be sending some information out about him, the mastermind group that he's starting, and um, that way you'll have other resources to look to. So uh, anyway, take care, folks. I hope you have a great rest of your week or weekend whenever you might be listening to this. And uh, again, thank you for joining me on, in this journey. been listening to the practice of therapy podcast with gordon brewer please visit us at practiceoftherapy.com for more information resources and tools to help you in starting building and growing your private practice and if you haven't done so already please sign up to receive the free private practice startup guide at practiceoftherapy.com The information in this podcast is intended to be accurate and authoritative concerning the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, or producers are rendering legal, accounting, or clinical advice. If you need a professional, you should find the right person for that.